Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guest on Facing the Canon is Roy Crown from Hope Together. Roy Crown, welcome to Facing the Canon. Great to be here, John. It's really great. Thrilling to have you, Roy. We've known each other for over four decades. That is amazing. It we is. both started in itinerant evangelism the same day. Absolutely. Because you will, will tell that story. That's right. You started for a parachurch ministry. I started at a church, but we were involved in missions together. But let's start with your story, Roy. You were born, brought up in the East End of London. Yes, I was born under the sound of Bow Bells. And my dad was a Fleet Street printer, used to print the Daily Mirror, which is a national newspaper. My mum was a seamstress. So she would get material. And then by the end of the week, she'd make suits out of this material. Absolutely amazing. I remember one story because I've got a brother as well. We were going to a wedding and mum said, we need to go out and buy suits for these two boys. I must have been eight, my brother was 10. And we went around all these shops. She came back, she said, it's no good. I'm gonna have to make one. So she made from nothing, two suits. My brother and I turned up at this wedding and they said, who made these suits? My mum did. Your mum makes suits. Yeah, that's what she does. So yeah, I was born in the East End of London. So you should have said they were designer suits <laughs> made by Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Crown. <laughs> yeah, I didn't yeah. know enough then no. to know that's what you said. I just said my mum did it. No, no, you, I, there's a story about you in the local market. You were selling things at a young age. Yeah, that's right. So Dorston Market, which is basically a, well, it, it was the market. Everybody went there. And there was something in me that just thought, I could get some stuff and set up a stall. Now you needed a trader. So I said to one of the stall owners, would you let me have a slot on the end? And he said, yeah, what are you gonna do? I said, well, I don't know whether I'll make any money on it. And I found this stuff that I managed to sell and I loved it. I just loved it. And there's a statement, pile them high, watch them fly. And I had these books that nobody, and I just got rid of them all. And I thought, I'll only do this once because they might come back next week and say that book. <laughs> I wasn't a Christian then, but in the East End, you learn very quickly that I loved it. It was just a great community. It's very different to what it is now, but it was just a fantastic upbringing. And you learn quickly. I never went to church. The reason I never went to church is my brother went to Sunday school once, didn't like it. So my parents never sent me. And that was the end of that. That was the end of that. But a friend of yours from school invited yeah. you to a camp. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, the back story is I got moved in school to sit next to him as a punishment. So he was the only Christian in our school. And my punishment was to sit next to this Christian. Not just for one lesson, but for the term. And he kept talking to me about faith. He kept saying to me, Crowny, because my nickname yes. is Roy Crown, but they always called me Crowny. And it's fascinating, you know, we had two children. Everybody would call them Crowny. Crowny just was what you did. It was called, anyway, he said to me, the trouble with you, Crowny, is you've got no guts. I said, what do you mean? He said, because you're not prepared to face up to the claims of Jesus Christ. And I thought, well, that is completely different to anything I'd ever heard. I actually felt churches were a little bit scary, John. Uh, they looked a bit... We never visited them as no, family. No, so you didn't have experience of them. It's your perception of Currently. them. Currently. Yes. And, and Anglican and okay, Yeah, it was just like, why would you go in there? What? And as a teenager. But this guy said, come on a Christian camp. And I don't think... His view, he said it will be fun. I'm like, I think your view of fun and my view of fun was completely different when I arrived on this camp. But it was a great camp. It was an organization called Covenanters, yes. which is why I believe in residential experience to change people's lives. Wednesday night, heard the gospel, 
Guy called for a response. I didn't go forward, but I went out into the field in Polzeef, which is in Cornwall, and I just said, God, if you're real and you can meet a person like me from the East End, then I want you just to come and change my life. And I was just talking like I'm talking to you. And God did something in my life. I have to say, it says in the Bible that it's a scary thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I would say that for the first time in my life, I knew there was a spiritual world and that God had touched my life. It, it was, I saw things, I felt things, I got on my knees. I just confessed stuff, just like I'm talking to you. And God came into my life. And your life changed? It, yeah. I mean, it really did. So within two weeks, I'd read the whole Bible. You were just so hungry. Because I, I said, what have I got into? What is this? Now, I didn't fully understand it. Of course no. I didn't. And then I went to a church that I didn't fully understand or get because it was a little bit different to anything I'd experienced. But I went back to the school I was in after the summer and uh, went and saw the headmaster. Oh, that's, this is great. <laughs> First time I'd ever gone and seen him without an invitation. Because in the Gospels, it said that we're called to communicate this Gospel. And I was leaving school that year and I thought, I'm not going to get round one on one. Why don't I just go and see the head and see if I could take a school assembly? That's crazy. And I'd never stood in front of anybody. Well, I'd done the stall thing on the market yeah, at Yeah, but nothing public. No. No, no. So that took a bit of courage. Uh, uh, but obviously something had happened to you so much you couldn't help but talk about it. Yeah, it was a crazy idea. And um, didn't the headmaster say to you, I don't like doing assemblies, <laughs> so you can do two? Well, he said, I'll reflect on it. And then he came back and he said, yeah. He said, don't do one, you can do two, because I don't like doing them. I'm like, I only need one. But I did do two. But you got up in front of all your peers and you told them that you'd become a Christian. You told, told them the them, story. Yeah, I told them what happened to me in the summer and that it totally revolutionised my life. And it changed my attitude to my parents, changed my attitude to the head and to the school. It changed my attitude to friends because God had affected other, every other relationship. So it was just... I then realised that when you go public about your faith, everything changes, John. Yes. Because in school, now, yes. we're a little bit older, you and I. In schools then, you had the whole, you had year seven, year eight, right up to sixth form. So it was like a thousand kids. I tell you, I was so scared. I'm not sure I did a good job, but what I did do was communicate that I'd had a personal relationship that Absolutely. changed my life. You, you joined a church, there weren't many youth, you got involved in the youth, and the youth group just exploded. It really did. Because, following the assembly, I invited everyone to this local church that didn't have any youth work. And a guy in the church said, you can have it on a Friday night. And we had a riot. I mean, queues were broken. It was, it was a classic yeah. Friday night club. But then, because I thought this is what you do and this is what I saw in the camp, at 8.30, I said, right, you're all in this room. Everybody be quiet. I'm going to tell you about God. And every week, that's why I think I read the Bible, and that's why I think I prayed, because I knew I had to do this talk every Friday. So you join Youth for Christ as an evangelist, and you end up becoming the national director. So how many years were you with Youth for Christ? 28. What did you see? Give us some pictures of what you, did you see during those 28 years? Well, we both started as evangelists with a guy called Eric Dell, didn't yes, we? we? And did. we were his kind of associate evangelists. Like his Timothy's, <laughs> weren't we? <laughs> and we'd, we'd go to universities and we'd talk to people on the lift or we'd do small groups or we'd just encourage them to come to the meeting or whatever. So this passion to see Christ presented to young people was what I just thought, I've got to do this. I've just, if I've got an opportunity to give my life to it, it's amazing. So Youth for Christ, when you say, what did I see? I saw that, well, I saw many, many things. But one of the things I really saw was that you've got to, when God births a ministry, and this was birthed by Lee, Billy Graham, 
That was its DNA. That was what it called Youth for Christ into being for. If you move away from that and you start doing all these other things that are good and legitimate and valid, but it wasn't the peace that Youth for Christ was born to bring. And you need to trust the body of Christ that other people will do that other stuff, but this is why FC's piece in the puzzle which is a beautiful puzzle, but our piece in the jigsaw is this, communicating the gospel peer-to-peer to to young people. So I was passionate about communicating that and initiating that. And I think God showed me, there was a book I read called Built to Last when I became national director, because we'd been around 50 years. And it looked at companies and it asked, what caused them to remain at the top? And what it was, keep your core, but innovate on the edges. And when I became national director, I felt that we'd lost a bit of our core, went back to our DNA, and then God just was amazing in what he did in that time. I mean, it was a gift, because we'd had a tough time as Youth for Christ Absolutely. up until then. Yeah. Really tough. So it's like realigning, really, and, and refocusing yeah. Of what the roots were about. Yeah, and I think if you're a church leader and you go to a church, think of the DNA. How did that get planted? What was its DNA? What was it about? What did God do? And when you move away from that, I think you lose something of the anointing, something of what God brought that to being. And it's quite a large organisation, isn't it? Employing how many evangelists? Well, in my tenure... Or now? In your tenure. So when we first got in place, I was kind of probably 35 centres around the country and then I grew it to 60 over that period of local ministries based in locations, spaces, engaging. Then there was a piece of research that came out that said the church was losing a lot of young people at the age of 11. So I set up a project to say... That was amazing. So I said, if we just tell these to church leaders, they're going to say, I'm not really bothered about young people. I don't really care. Because they don't. Half of them, like those young people, they're going to be a problem in my church anyway. So so I said, we then ran a thing called Spring Harvest, which was a big festival. And I said, we've got to communicate this research in such a way that everybody goes, oh, we have a problem. So one night in the big top, there must have been 5,000 people, we did it each week. We brought in 900 young people from the youth venues. They were partying, they were having fun, the music was up, the lights were up. Then the lights all died down and all these kids walked out in silence. And I said, that's how many young people we are losing in the church every month. All of a sudden, they got the message. Yeah. All of a sudden, you communicated. Wow. And that just launched a whole sure. new ministry. That's pretty a dramatic effect, isn't it? <laughs> but sometimes the statistic doesn't impact you. No, it doesn't. Until you see it. Correct. Yeah. I often say, Roy, uh, the Lord guides our steps and he guides our stops. And y- you've been very good at trying to discern when it's time to move on. And then hope together. Yeah. Oh wait. Yeah. How did that come about? And what is hope together? What was it? Well, hope oh eight came about because I also believe that we have to work together. So, if we're in ministry, we've got to find our peers and organisations and find a way to work together. And because I was in youth ministry. There was a Greek guy called Mike Pulavachi who ran an amazing event called Soul Survivor that was just fantastic and had a phenomenal impact. Then a guy in Manchester called Andy Hawthorne who ran the Message Trust and really believed everything happened out of Manchester. Yes. That was just what he was passionate about. So we used to meet once a term because we were the kind of leading youth ministries at yes. that time. And I said, let's do some things together. And we did some citywide things with communicating the gospel and acts of kindness. So instead of 
this dilemma of social action and proclamation being separated, two sides of the same coin. So you love your neighbor and you tell them about Jesus. Let's do it together and let's take a step of faith. So we did Soul in the City together. We did Festival Manchester. Then cities were coming to us saying, would you come and do that? Because we mobilized young people. They went in and served. It was a phenomenal experience. I said, this is ridiculous. Why don't we just go for a big year of mission? Yes. And that was Hope 08. And it, and it had the hand of God on it. You know, some things you do, you just think... It's true. The favour of God. It was that. I know. Well, I, I was involved in um, the one in London. I was involved in the one in Manchester. Yeah. And you're right, Roy. There was something incredible. Uh, and they were out in London. They were out doing all types of good works and in the evening they could go to all types of venues and I was preaching every night for 10 nights in St Paul's Cathedral. Oh it was amazing. It was incredible. And they had small coffee bars sharing yes. testimony. It was as diverse as London with all sorts of opportunities. So and thousands of young people were involved. Thousands. It was an amazing adventure. Risky, really risky and you know budgets getting churches on board. And the interesting thing, the smaller churches embraced it first. Yeah. And then the larger churches came on board when they realized God was in it and it was looking at something because they can do that. Anyway, so cut a long story short, that was amazingly fruitful. We then did an evaluation, which I think is really important. If we do anything, let's evaluate how effective it was. And they said, we think hope was catalytic in getting churches working together and enabled the church to effectively serve and love its community. So it should live on. I'd been leading Youth for Christ up until that point as national director 13 years. And I just thought, I think I'm a bit entrepreneurial. You're running a big organization. You can't always do that there. Of course. (laughs) Well, managing a massive ministry and then trying to take on another initiative so I'd stepped down and they said, Roy, why don't you take this on? And Hope Together was born. And I have to say, for the last 10 years, it's been an amazing journey. So Roy, in these last 10 years, tell us some of the projects that you were initiated and were involved in. Well, I think prophetically you need to see things. And I saw the Queen coming up to her 50th yes and i thought that's an amazing opportunity she loves christ she's got a personal faith even if i am not a royalist but i love the queen everybody loved the queen so huge respect absolutely and i discovered that at her coronation the archbishop gave her a book and said this book is the highest honor that man affords i said that's it that text is in the ceremony it is it's incredible isn't it let's produce a new testament that we can cover with a union flag, with the story and just the text of scripture. And let's get it available, accessible, not at a big, but at the cheapest price we can do it. So churches, one church bought 10,000 copies. To give away. To give away to their street party. And they gave away all of them. Because everybody was taking it. And during that time, the union flag was everywhere. So we managed to get Biblica to give us the rights in a special way to that New Testament, and they didn't charge us, which they would normally do, and we were then able to distribute it. And we printed printed 50,000 initially, and my board were like, this is a bit of a risk, Roy, because 50,000, 50p a book, we're going to... Then we had to print 50,000, 50,000, three quarters of a million, and we were under pressure because the 2nd of June was coming. So we're getting prints going, 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 going. People gave it to their grandchildren, gave it to parents. Schools, junior schools, this, instead of buying a mug or something else, they gave out this New Testament to Amazing. all the children in school. I love that, Roy, because, yes, it's great to give out other types of resources. Yeah. And as you know, we've got resources <laughs> that we like giving out. You can't beat giving out the um, original script. And I got emails back from people, come to faith. They'd been reading it. They'd been reading it with a grand Because the Queen was given this, it kind of gave it a hook to say, this is what our Queen. And then I just then discovered, hey, 
this is a unique moment. So when she was 90, I said to two other groups, we need to produce a queen, uh, sorry, a book on the queen's 90th birthday. Yes. Because I said, who's going to tell her faith story? <laughs> and we produced a book that should have been probably five pound or whatever. We produced it for a pound. It was the servant queen and the king she served. It's beautiful. And it's the only book the queen has ever written the forward for. She's never written a forward to anything. And I was sitting with these other organizations and they were saying, who's going to write the forward? I said, the queen. They said, the queen's never written a forward to anything. I said, we've got to get the queen. It's going to authenticate the entire book. They said, you won't get it. I said, let's try. And she was a patron of one of these organizations. They wrote to her and we were hearing nothing. And the June date's coming, you know, this is like, well, wait, how are we going to get this? Let's pray. We prayed. And then there were some insights and miracles that happened. Yes. Whereby the queen wrote the foreword, which authenticated the book. About her faith. About her and, and her the personal king, faith. And the king that she serves. Yeah. Amazing. I know. And the quality was amazing, Roy. I don't know if I told you, but I personally bought 100 copies of that book and gave it out to neighbours. Oh, it was an easy give. Easy give. Everyone wanted it. And they, they then went, oh, the Queen's got a... She, the classic. She was doing a... <laughs> she gives out... I think it's on Shrove Tuesday. She goes to a cathedral yes. and does she give us out the coins or some That's sort of... That's right. And I think she was going to Leicester and Leicester contacted me. They said, you got any more of those books? I said, yeah. And they gave these books to everyone that was there. The Queen was there. She saw the book given, given out and she went past. She said, I'm, I'm so pleased you're giving out my book. Yes. It's not her book, it's our book. <laughs> but it's the story of her And it's owned faith. by her. Very good. And a million copies. That's so It was the highest in that year. Amazing. The Lord's led you on. You're focusing now. Uh, you set up a trust called Revelation Trust. Yeah. Is that about the second coming? <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Go on. What's this new initiative now, Roy? Well, I'm convinced where the church is at, John, we need more entrepreneurial leadership in the local church. That we need, because we're such a mission opportunity here in the UK, I think we need to recruit people that have the gospel front and centre, but their leadership is more entrepreneurial than it's ever been. Not just doing what was, but creating new social enterprise, church context. So Revelation Trust is just a vehicle. I've got 12 guys that are linking with me uh, that I'm kind of investing in. They're 30 somethings, which is great for me because they I learn from them as much as I'm giving to them. But I just want to see this more entrepreneurial spirit in the church. If you're an entrepreneur, everybody says to you go into business. I'm like, yeah, that's one way you could do it. But there's another way you could do it. Bring your entrepreneurial gifts and use it in the local church. Use it in social enterprise. And I, it, it was launched last year. It's been amazing. Been linking with Bible colleges, looking at Aldenans, Church of England, how we bring new people into that space. And I just think in this final piece of the journey that I'm on, I'm like, I've always done that in Youth for Christ. I always invested in the new generation, the upcoming generation, and it's just part of my DNA. So I thought, this final shot, that's what I really want to do. If I've got any learning, anything I can give, I'm going to give it away. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to encourage them. Learn together. And it's Revelation Trust, but it's Gospel Entrepreneurs. I, I'm reminded as you speak there, Roy, of what the evangelist D.L. Moody said. I'd rather put 10 men to work than do the work of 10 men. And of course, we would rather put a thousand men and women to work Correct. than do the work of a thousand men and women. So you're basically saying, let's release this new emerging generation and help them to release what God's put in them. Absolutely. So that they can fulfill God's calling. 
but it's got to be gospel front and center and and if you don't hold that true you can be entrepreneurial but it's got to be the kingdom it's got to be the gospel and that's my dna that's everything we've done as gospel proclamation in serving our communities and loving our communities and i think hey that's what i want to give the next season of my life to I, I love the fact, Roy, that you always come back to the gospel, always come back to Jesus. You know, there's a lot of great things, but but this is the track God's called you on. And you've created a podcast. Yeah. Tell us about that. So I discovered that a lot of people don't know the stories of people that are entrepreneurial in gospel. They think this is a new thing. Anybody that's been effective in proclamation, social enterprise, is an entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur. You're one of the podcasts. So I'm doing a podcast with UCB and the six series that we've done. Joanna up in Junction 42 in the North in prisons. She's so entrepreneurial. She didn't want to work in the religious department. She started to work in education and through education built connections saw people coming to faith. So she was very entrepreneurial looking at the prison setting. There are people that are so entrepreneurial. John Kirby, entrepreneurial, classic entrepreneur, really, in what he did with Cap and the way he took that. These people are heroes of the faith, but they're very entrepreneurial. So I want to role model these people to say, hey, these people are out there. There are the... William Booth, what an entrepreneur. Yes. I mean, he never backed off from preaching the gospel when no. he did the Salvation Army, but he was entrepreneurial in match factories, in building communities. Classic gospel entrepreneur. Telling their stories. Absolutely. So those podcasts, the, the interest around them have been great. Roy, you are an absolute tonic and... Thank you so much for telling us a bit of your story and joining us on Facing the Canon. Great to be with you. I'm sure you're inspired. I'm inspired by just some of those amazing stories that Roy has shared. Yes, God has put all sorts of gifts in us and let's pray that those gifts are released and that we all fulfill God's call in our lives. Thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.